What's going on guys? It's Bromley at Empire Barbell. Today we're going to go over a little bit of programming and we're going to do so by picking apart Prilipin's chart. I got pulled onto the subject of Prilipin's chart because Josh Bryant, uh, who if you don't know Josh Bryant, he's a fantastic coach. He's been around for a while. He's a beast in his own right, but he also coaches a lot of world-class raw lifters, including Julius Maddox, who just set the all-time bench record at 739 and some change. I like Josh's work because he does a good job pairing formal and informal systems. The formal systems being the academic background he has in exercise science and the attention he pays to other older systems that have been tested, like what the Soviet systems have produced. The informal systems are things like his book, Jailhouse Strong, where he goes over how prison inmates got strong and jacked off of prison food and really having no training resources to speak of. He also pays a lot of attention to more typical bodybuilding protocols, which we can put in that informal category. So a lot of it's anecdotal, a lot of it's stuff that people just do because that's what they were told to do when they got into it. And a lot of it is just time tested. So pairing those two systems together, there's not a lot of people that do it and do it well. He's definitely one of them. And I think that's an asset to him as a coach. It's one of the reasons I have a lot of respect for him. But Josh Bryant put up a post regarding Prilipin's chart recently and why he doesn't use it. This chart falls into the category of things I don't have a strong opinion about until I see how rooted it is in the dogma of pop training culture. When I see people cling very tightly to an idea, not even if it's a bad idea, but if it's an idea that is not as good as people think it is, that's when I feel the need to speak up and really give some perspective on it. So that's what we're gonna do today. Now, for those of you that don't know Prilipin's chart, it's based off the works of A.S. Prilipin. He was a Soviet Olympic weightlifting coach. He worked for the Soviet sports system from 1975 to 1985. And the Soviet sports system was a beast. I mean, they took a scientific approach to not just sports, but to weightlifting in general in a way that nobody really has done before or has done since. For that reason, even modern powerlifting culture pulls a lot from the works of the Soviet sports scientists from the 70s. Now, as good and as unprecedented as a lot of the data might be, I also have a bias against an overly academic approach. And when I look at this system, and how much of an incentive there was to make your name within that system. It's not just about your athletes, but those guys were expected to create the findings that would prop up the Soviet system for generations to come and keep them as a powerhouse on an international platform. So if any of you have ever worked at a job where there's like too many managers, you know what that arms race is for guys to kind of edge each other out and make their name and the stupid shit that they end up focusing on to try and you know, set themselves apart. They try to solve problems that don't need to be solved, or they start to fixate on things that are kind of arbitrary or unimportant. And that's because there's too many goddamn cooks in the kitchen. I don't know that Prilipin's chart is an example of that, but that's a perspective I take with me when I go in to try and analyze it and pick it apart. Now, one of the reasons I use that analogy is because Prilipin's chart is very broad. And not only is it broad, but there's parts of it that don't line up well for powerlifting that people often have to tweak. So I look at it as if you have a chart or a guideline and it doesn't clearly define what you're supposed to do and the rules still need tweaking, how good is that as a frame of reference anyways? My argument is it's not really, but we're going to go into that in just a minute. So in Prilipin's time in the Soviet sports system, he analyzed a bunch of his elite lifters. He compiled data on the reps they used, how many total reps they did, and at what threshold they were training at. And his idea was to find an optimal range for each re uh, each percentage threshold to try and find you know what the best set and rep scheme was to give the best training outcome. Now that's already some terminology that's fuzzy. In all of the the research you do in Prilipin's chart, you'll see the term positive training outcome used. But it's not clear if that means they did well progressing into their next wave. I don't know if that means they got stronger next time around. I don't know if that just means that the bar path looked good or that the bar speed was high or that technique was reinforced. Now, the idea is that this range is in kind of a Goldilocks zone where you're not doing too much to overtrain and you're not doing too little so that you elicit some training response, but technique and recoverability, it's, it's a big part of all of that. So that gets included here. Now, different systems rely on different modes of training and different intensities, not just percentage, but intensity as an effort. So if you have a program that hinges entirely on manipulation of volume and intensity over time by counting total tonnage and manipulating it, those systems 
are going to be more about those numbers than they're going to be about absolute effort. It's not going to be about breaking yourself against the weight every day and doing more and more and more and more. It's going to be about doing your homework and meeting these concrete numbers so that you get this very predictable wave of volume and intensity over time. That's very different from the way a lot of programs are structured today, especially in Western culture. We like our AMRAPs. We like heavy lifting. There's a reason West Side's so popular. People like the idea of doing a max effort work on a, on a weekly basis. And that differs greatly from the type of work, not just older powerlifters did, but the type of work that weightlifters do. So to start off, I mean, one of the first things that, that stands out is Prolipid's chart. This is all weightlifting data and not just weightlifters, but elite weightlifters. So weightlifting is a sport, very explosive. It's all or nothing. You can't grind a clean, a jerk or a snatch. It has to, I mean, you hit it hard enough at the start to finish it or you don't, it's that simple. So you'll notice that the rep ranges, because we have our percentages, these are the optimal rep ranges. This is the optimal total number of reps. And then over here is actually a range of the total number of reps that you can get in and still be considered optimal. So it's just broad on top of broad. You'll notice that 70% and under three, four, five, six reps are recommended. Well, in powerlifting, obviously, we like our high reps. Reason being, powerlifting movements are good developmental exercises, okay, squatting, pressing, even deadlifting for more than six reps at a lighter percentage, that can help build muscle tissue. It can help build work capacity. Those are things we use in most periodization schemes so that down the line, when we get more specific and we work on strength and power, we have a foundation of extra muscle tissue and capacity to work off of. The Olympic lifts don't work the same way. Nobody does clean snatches or jerks for the purpose of hypertrophy, meaning nobody's gonna do a set of 10 in a split jerk. You're gonna see bar speed decline, you're gonna see technique deviate, and it's gonna be counterproductive to what they're trying to do. So already you're finding that we're gonna to have to make changes to this to kind of fit what is typically done in powerlifting schemes. The fact that they were elite weightlifters, that's relevant. Even if it's not the genetic argument that these are outliers and they respond to different types of training and it doesn't apply to most people, the fact is elite Olympic weightlifters have an immense background of sport-specific training. You're talking about systems that pull lifters out when they're you know 10 years old or younger, where they spend years drilling technique, where they're pre-selected for their explosiveness by you know via their jumping ability, and where they have just years and years of adaptation to a certain amount of work. The average lifter that's gonna get thrown into a program based off Prilipin's chart in the Western culture, it's not gonna have that same background, not even close. And in the past, we've already gone over some of the differences between newer lifters and more advanced lifters. I mean, there's neurological differences, there's technical differences. You respond to training, your response to training is very different. Now, over here, I outlined the set and rep options that you see. Now, you're gonna see this set is very broad and it contains a lot of proven, I would say, appropriate set and rep ranges at these thresholds. I mean, in here, you're gonna see, you know, five sets of five, four sets of six. Uh, you're gonna see, you know, five sets of three, you're gonna see a lot of commonly used set and rep schemes. Part of that I believe is accidental. I mean, the program's so broad that it's going to, I think, accidentally contain productive working sets, but you have to look at the threshold that they're being used at. Uh, 70 to 80 and 70 and under, I mean, you're looking at three to six reps is basically prescribed for everything under 80%. Also notice how wide the range is, 70 to 80, 80 to 90. If I'm doing sixes at 70%, that's a lot different than doing sixes at 80%. Now it would be, reasonable to assume that the higher rep ranges are going to correlate to lower percentages, but that's actually not necessarily the case. Uh, there's nothing about Prolipin's chart that gives any insider direction as to what percentages are appropriate with what reps and at what point in the training that's appropriate. Now the dates that Prolipin was present in the Soviet sports system are relevant because a lot of people assign other programs as being based off of Prolipin's chart like five by five systems, like the Texas method, and some of the older linear progressions that you're gonna see. Yes, five by five is included, and they usually start somewhere in the 70% and up range. That being said, five by five started in the 50s. They predate Prilipin by 20 or 25 years. And part of my critique of this chart, it's not necessarily that none of these recommendations are valid. It's that you can find those recommendations by another more principled path that is relevant to powerlifting or typical barbell training and not have the pitfalls that you're gonna have with the higher and lower rep ranges where things are ultimately gonna to have to be tweaked and rearranged. I actually got into it with Swede Burns on Josh Bryan's thread. 
because somebody tagged Swede saying, well, fifth set is based off Prolipin's chart. And then Swede responded, yes, so is 531 and all other powerlifting programs at work. Well, let's dip into that for a minute. So both 531 and fifth set are examples of simple linear progressions. Linear progression is simply you start with a baseline, a certain amount of weight for a certain amount of sets and reps. Each week, your training progression is very simple. You just add five to 10 pounds or whatever the recommendation is. So fifth set is Swede's program. This basic progression, five by two at 80%, sure, that falls in line with Prolipin's chart. But this is an arbitrary starting point. You're starting at 80%, you're doing five doubles. The last set, the fifth double you're doing, the fifth set, you're doing an AMRAP. Now, if Prolipin's chart is designed to keep you in this range to guide your progress by limiting how much work you do on a daily basis, where does an AMRAP fit into that? Because an AMRAP isn't going to fall into this chart. It's going to be the most you can do that day. The progression from week to week is also going to have nothing to do with this chart or these numbers. It's going to be an arbitrary amount of weight. The logical starting point for any linear progression is going to be easy to derive completely independently of Prolipin's chart. And the idea is at that time, that linear progression is going to lend itself to an adaptation to that extra workload. The adaptation has nothing to do with an adherence to this. It has to do with an adherence to this arbitrary set and rep scheme with an AMRAP every week that progresses linearly. 531 is the same thing, it's just a little more complex. Week one is ramping sets of five at 65, 75, 85%. We have the same structure where the real meat and potatoes of the program is week one to AMRAP at 85%, AMRAP at 90%, AMRAP at 95%. You deload and then you reset the cycle five or 10 pounds heavier, whatever the recommendation is. Just like with fifth set, the progression doesn't have anything to do with an adherence to this chart week to week. It's sticking to these exact same sets and reps and progressing linearly. And the idea is as you get stronger, these AMRAPs are gonna get harder, which means you're gonna be working at a higher threshold. So all of the considerations Prolipin made for good training outcome, bar speed, technique, you know, staying short of failure so that you can reinforce good training habits, that all goes out the window. Now I'm not saying that these guys didn't look at this chart and use it for some amount of inspiration. What I am saying is it is insanely disingenuous to say five, three, one, or fifth set have any real important tie to Prolipin's chart when it comes to deciding what about those programs work. It's much more honest to say that these programs were derived from much older linear progressions that have been around a lot longer. In fact, I would say that more inspiration was taken from Mark Ripito for five, three, one than anything Prolipin put out. Now the defenders of the system on top of saying that, well, so many other systems use it successfully, they're also gonna say things like, well, it's a tool, it's a good guideline. My whole argument is that no, it's not a good guideline. Just like I stated before, incredibly broad, non-specific recommendations at different thresholds that don't take into account frequency, don't take into account fatigue. They don't even take into account the different lifts. I mean, all the work, let's say someone like Chad Smith puts in to figuring out what your optimal MRV is, maximum recoverable volume. They'll go into age, sleep patterns, how long you've been training, how hard your job is, and they'll even go into a chart about squat, benching, and deadlifting, and how different those rep and set recommendations are. That is, and while I think it might be a little overdone, that is at least an intelligent approach to trying to decipher what the optimal rep ranges should be at certain points in the program. This falls short. Now I came across one good article put out by Jay Ashman who runs Kansas City Barbell. And I've kind of loosely followed Jay for a while. He's, I think he's a good coach, he's a smart guy. And I really expected to see just another run of the mill regurgitation in his blog of what Prolipin's chart was. I was actually very surprised to find out he gave a very intelligent dissection of the chart and gave his own revised chart that adjusted some of these percentages to make a little bit more sense. Basically, the changes he made address the things that anyone who's been training for any period of time can already see when they first look at it, and that's that you need less work at the 90% range and more work at the 80% and under range. So these rep ranges, instead of three to six, is eight to 12. In most programs regarding powerlifting, if you're under 70%, you're doing hypertrophy work, more sets, more reps, and you're typically going to far exceed this set recommendation right here. I mean, there's a reason eight by eight and 10 by 10 programs are used. It's outside of the realm of what Prolipin's chart was trying to find. Four to six reps instead of two to three. Basically, that just means the effort's gonna be a little bit higher. It means that we allow for the reps to be a little bit slower. 
Grinding is part of lifting. Hypertrophy is part of lifting. Is part of lifting. Strength endurance is part of lifting. And you're not going to do that if every single rep you ever do goes off like a gunshot. You need work in your program in different phases. That's going to have you a little bit fatigued and a little bit grindy. Now, even these recommendations, while I think they're a bit more intelligent, they're on the right track. It still doesn't really address, you know, what range and where. It doesn't address direction. And really, the the biggest thing that stands out to me is anybody who's in a position to make those decisions is already going to know intuitively what rep ranges are more important and what percentages. Now, this is ultimately the chart I use, and I'm going to fill that out. And this is a chart that each one of you should use. Now, if you take this chart and you mirror it against something like this, that's going to get you way closer to where you want to be, and you're going to be making a lot more intelligent decisions in your training. So most programs, not all, some go in between, but most bracket their percentages off at 5% increments, 65, 70, 75, 80. So instead of having these broad 10% rep ranges where 70 and 80% are treated as about the same, what you want to find is what your estimated rep max is for each lift at each one of these percentage thresholds. What I then do is I make a chart of what my difficulty is with each rep at that same percentage. So let's say I'm at 85% right here for a bench press. I know for myself that 85% in a bench press, if I'm going all out, that's six reps. So what that means for me is that a 10 out of 10 effort at 85% is going to be six reps. If I take a rep away, that's going to be a nine out of 10 effort at five reps. Now, most of my training for the volume work that I do with the main lifts is going to fall between the six, seven, and eight range on an RPE scale. And to get those, you just take reps away. So if five is going to be a nine out of 10 difficulty, then an eight out of 10 difficulty is going to be four reps and then three reps and then two reps. Six, that's like I'm just starting to work. That's like 85%. I need some warm up. I need a little bit of mental attention into what I'm doing, but I don't need to push the gas too hard to get two reps out at 85%. So if I fill this chart out, I know what reps I should be hitting if I'm going balls out 100% at a given percentage. Now that's good for when you do testing sets so you can get a good idea if you're progressing. Now some programs have more auto regulation like that, some don't. But this is also why I say that you shouldn't need to hit a one rep max to get an idea of if you're progressing. If I'm at 90% and I do six, I know my max has gone up because traditionally that's, that's three or four for me. Now this green band is where most of my prescribed reps are gonna be. Most of my training is a set amount of work that's sub-maximal where I'm not going all out, I'm not going to failure. It's the same thing that Prilipin's chart is trying to address. This is just how I structure it. Now seven to eight, that's kind of the middle of the bell curve. That's where, that's where most of your work is gonna be or where most of your work should be. So bell curve looks like that. So seven to eight, that's most of my work right there. I'm gonna hit an eight difficulty or a nine difficulty about as often as I hit a six and tens are really for testing. That only comes at the end of a really heavy wave or really only comes at the end if I do have AMRAPs in, which sometimes I throw them in. But for the most part, most of my volume per, uh, volume training, it's getting these reps out. This is how you keep your reps quality. It's how you keep them fast. It's how you keep your technique good. The, exactly what Prolipin Chart is supposed to address. You're trying to refine good habits. You're trying to keep control. And you're also trying to get the benefit of whatever training block you're in. So if I'm at these lower percentages, I'm training for hypertrophy. 6, 8, 10, 12, that over so many sets is going to elicit a hypertrophy, a hypertrophy effect. My strength endurance is going to get better. If I'm using CAT, compensatory acceleration training, the earlier rep should be going off like a gunshot. I could also be doing time under tension, pause work, uh, tempo work. I could also be you know, working the eccentric, slowing it down to try and exaggerate that hypertrophy effect. Maybe get more stable around a sticky point. There's a lot of different ways you can apply this, but that's gonna be the goal for the power lifter. Now in these heavier ranges, this is where I'm gonna strain a little more. This is where force production is gonna go up. This is where I'm gonna be pushing against heavier loads and I'm going to be now training hard enough to derive more benefit from those loads. But it's the same idea as Prolipin's chart. I'm not doing so much that I'm burning myself out for each consecutive set or for each consecutive workout, yet I'm not doing so little that I'm not gonna derive any training benefit at all. So my recommendation, write this chart out for yourself. Do it for your big lifts, your squat, your bench, your deadlift, your overhead. 
you might have gaps. You might not know exactly. Just give your best educated guess. If you're going to use something like Prilipin's chart, make sure you're using something like this to massage the numbers and keep yourself honest. That's my rant on Prilipin's chart. If you have anything to add, any arguments, and I'm sure there's going to be some, go ahead and leave them in the comment box. I'll do my best to have a good, clean, civil discourse over this topic. Thanks for watching, guys. Until next time, this is Bronley at Empire Barbell. I'll see you.